Hello and welcome to another episode of Ivy Games Weekly. I am your host, Austin Harrison, and I am super excited for today's episode. I have been wanting to do this episode since I saw this Kickstarter drop. So I'm really excited to first off, welcome my co-host, Sam Cowden, and then also Marcus Miller from the Hidden Leaders team. Guys, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, yeah, Marcus, um, we just met today, but I'm really, really excited to talk to you about Hidden Leaders. Uh, it is a game after my own heart because I I love the the hidden role games. I love the the strategy mixed with a hidden uh, or a social deduction game. So I'm I'm really pumped about it. And I love your guys' tagline, an unusual deduction game really is just one of those like draws you in things. So thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. I'm yeah. really thrilled to talk to you about these topics. Yeah, awesome. All right, right before that, we are going to do a giveaway. Um, so I want to give away a Moonmakers Kickstarter edition from our last show uh, of Ivy Games Weekly. I forgot to do it last week, so I was like, hey, we'll just do it live on the show. So we're going to do a random number generator between 1 and 47, and then go to the page and look down at the ninth comment. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. All right, Sarah Swank has won the Kickstarter exclusive edition. Oh, I'm not going to do that right now. The Kickstarter exclusive edition for that Ivy Games Weekly giveaway. We're going to do another giveaway this week. Uh, if you comment with the code word hidden after the show in the comment section, we will be giving away a pre-order of the Moonrakers uh, metal ship tokens. So uh, you guys can do that at the end, and we'd, we'd love to give those away to you. So, um, yeah, looking forward to that. Congrats, Sarah. Yeah, good job, Sarah. Um, really excited, Marcus, to play next week. We're playing Hidden Leaders on our Ivy Played stream on Wednesday. Um, I'll pu I'll push out the time for that later. But I I have not played, and I'm really excited to. So we're gonna have to rely on your your uh, just explanation of gameplay and stuff today. But first, before we get into the game, can you tell us a little bit about you and the team that made the game? How did you guys meet? How long did it take to develop the game? How did you find the idea for the game? Those are too many questions, but I'm, I'm sure you get the idea. Yeah, thank you again for having me. So it's uh, to talk a little bit about our team. We are all three from Austria, from a small town south, southern part of Austria. If you don't know where Austria is, it's somewhere between Germany and Italy. Um, somewhere over here, uh, if you can see that. And uh, yeah, it's my brother, Andreas, and myself. Uh, we obviously know each other for a very long time. And then uh, we have Raphael on board, whom, who was a kindergarten friend, uh, or we met at kindergarten and then went to preschool together um, and a couple of years at, uh, at school. And then we started playing pen and paper role-playing games at the age of 10, played like, and actually last 20 years, we played a ton of games. And we go into live action role playing events once a year. There's the world's largest live action role play event here happening here in Germany. And we kind of have built our own world in that. We dress up as like goblins and wizards and stuff. And, and this is like a lot of story inspiration came from that live action role play. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, that's the summary. And in, in real, like in real life, <laughs> we yeah. all do very different things. So Raphael is an architect. And with his like architect nature, he's taking care of design and and the the the, the, the artistic aspects of our game, coordinating mm -hmm. that with our artists, etc. Um, and doing a lot of the communication with content creators, etc. Because he's really a fan of all the different shows and following yeah. that. My brother Andreas, he's a historian, um, so he's a wow. story writer. He loves to like create worlds around characters and writes deep stories and like for each of the characters. And his second passion is data analysis. Uh, mm. So he, and with this combined some social media engagement and community engagement. So everything you read, we are posting is from Andreas. He's nice. doing daily updates, the, the, the Twitter things, the community stuff. So he's our writer, historian, and a little bit of the data guy. Um, and I'm the boring business guy. <laughs> Um, so you're not <laughs> my, my real not job, at all. <laughs> and uh, in my real job, I'm, I'm, I'm developing software. So I'm a, uh -huh. a product manager for software development. 
And but like this product management aspect is something I love to also do about the game, developing products without being dependent on engineers and designers so much. You can test ideas. So on the one hand side, I love to do the financial stuff, and then the other side, I, I'm the freak on game mechanics. So tweaking yeah. the last detail on the game mechanics, that's what I, I'm really passionate about. Nice. Okay, that was that was a perfect explanation of it. Um, I love that you guys have been playing games together for this long. Like that's that's incredible. That's like my dream is like me, Zach, and Sam are in the old ha- old age home together, and we're still playing like RPG games. That would be the best. Uh, but you've already like got like the 20, 30 years of that. So I'm very jealous of of you for having that long of a, a play group. That's that's incredible. But um, yeah, I would say you're not the boring person. You're the person that makes the dream happen. I mean, it, it wouldn't right. be possible without without the business person that's able to to bring down these creatives and ground them in reality. So, yeah, you're definitely not the boring person. Um, I just wanted to take a quick look at your guys's page because I think you did a really excellent job. Um, and, and I covered this in an episode of, of Ivy backed, but I love several aspects of your page and, and a couple of them I'd never seen before. The, the way you guys did quotes is the single best way I've ever seen quotes done on any Kickstarter page. I don't know if you saw that on another campaign and stole that idea, which you totally should have. That's, that's awesome if you did that. But like, I looked at this and was like, how have I not thought of this? Because it's so good. Like you guys just made some some choices that made it look like this was your 20th campaign and not your your first second kind of but we'll talk about that in a second and then the art style is just so cool and engaging uh i'm really pumped um how did you guys approach the art style did you guys find an artist that you kind of had the art style for or did you have like an art style you were going for and then find an artist yeah long story i keep it short um we we had this like we had the mechanics and the idea of the game, which was built around our life action role play world. I can say a bit more on that how we came up with the idea a little later, and we we checked out different artists from games we like, and I wrote a couple of emails to artists because we knew okay we can probably not afford a like very famous artist. Still, I reached out to multiple artists, and then one one or two artists reached back. And we found her artist, and she had a very cool style for very epic, dark fantasy games. And we designed 10 characters with her, showed this to like playtesters, and they told us, like, dudes, this is this doesn't fit the game. This is dark, heavy role play thing. And you have a light, fast, fun game with funny character, like fun character names mm. and stuff. That doesn't fit. So <clears throat> We actually went back and, and I, I have been in touch with one of my favorite artists, Roland McDonald or Roland Revenge. He's the signer of Western Legends, for example, um, and, and other great, great games. And he offered us some consulting and he like said basically the same. He said, you can do this Kickstarter on that artwork, but you won't stand out. It's just not a fantasy game. And then he proposed a couple of different artists to us. And they're like, look at look at these guys. They haven't done board games before, but they have a very unique style. Maybe you want to reach out to them. And one of them was Satoshi. Uh, and like we immediately knew, okay, this is the guy we want to work with. When, once we have seen his portfolio, we knew like we want to work with him. And we were just praying that he will re- follow up with us and reach back. Uh, and then we received the email and he said, sorry, I'm not good in English. Um, I'm not sure we can do this. And we organized a Japanese um, translator and had a call together, and I was it was and it worked out. So that's incredible. A very very like experienced designer helped us and recommended him, and then we basically took his portfolio of artwork and like tweak combined that with the world and and existing ideas of our style, and then he designed about like two dozens or. Like, about 20 characters exclusively for the game. So the leaders, the king, um, some additional female characters, they have been designed based on our specifications. But we also took some of the artwork, like the short-sighted soldier here, that he already had. Uh, because obviously we couldn't afford like having 72 characters or even more exclusively drawn for us for our very first game. So we took some like the, the cherries from his portfolio combined that with new ideas and then he also came up with a great artwork for the board so and then obviously that's only one piece of the cake the second was that roland 
who was consulting us, he did basically the final illustration combinations. He created mm -hmm. the, the icons, the backgrounds, or gave us some input so we, we could actually finish it. Because I can yeah. use Photoshop and Raphael too, but I'm not good in, I'm good enough in like, if there are some basics, I, I can make it re replicate a good style, but I can't come up with a good style myself. Right. We have we have a few favorites from our the people in the audience. We've got Casey Peterson says the art is cool and the characters are all funny. I love the vegetarian shark. We've got the uh, the firm fish farmer makes me laugh every time. Uh, slime with a sword, <laughs> like this is they're they're great. Like they're they're entertaining. They're aesthetically beautiful. I mean, you guys you guys really knocked that out of my out of the park in my opinion. Um, yeah. yeah, and we wanted to combine that, or like I think we combined it with very like funny character names or character names that make you smile. That's what we say, <laughs> and that's my brother's thing, strength. He's like always coming up with these like very special character names, yeah. and we want to have also diversity in the portfolio of characters, like all types of different characters. So we're celebrating diversity with that game, um, which don't see that often in fantasy games so we said like we want to make that colorful not just visually colorful no yeah it's great it's one of the things that i i loved about it as i was going through it was just the the vast um inspirational references it seemed like you guys had for for uh, all the different characters um seems like you're drawing from different historical periods different different uh, types of genres of games. There's some like Murloc in there. I don't know if that's that's World of Warcraft at all, uh, but um, I, I'd love to hear about where those those uh, inspirations came from, if there's anything specific. Some are obviously inspirations from our artist. He's inspired by a lot of my mythology and Japanese mythology, Germ Germanic mythology, or Nordic mythology. So it's like you're taking a lot of inspiration from different worlds. And if you look, check out his portfolio, he has even like avocado warriors and banana warriors. <laughs> like too crazy for our game. <laughs> and it's like kind of his inspiration. And then with like our inter in our brainstorming, that kind of multiplied the ideas. And there is more crazy stuff to come with expansions. I think Fun. That's awesome to hear. I'm, I'm excited you guys are already thinking about expansions. That's awesome. All right. So that's a little bit of the inspiration on the art and, and the kind of direction, how you got to where you did. How did you get the inspiration for the game? What, what kind of pushed you guys toward doing uh, a strategic deduction style game? So the, the initial inspiration was actually coming from our live action role play world. We wanted to create a game based on the characters that we have built in that world for years. And we wanted to create a game for our live action role play group to learn about this world and characters. So one afternoon, my brother and I went for a walk and we brainstormed, OK, if we would have built a game on that world, what game mechanics could we combine? And we brainstormed on all our favorite game mechanics, combined that to a quite heavy strategic area control deduction game, one and a half, two hours. And we de developed the game, played it multiple times, but realized it's too complex and long for our live action role play team uh, game yep. that, that is not so into heavy board games. So we said, OK, how can we take the core of that game, take everything else away, and, and make it a simple card game? And then kind of that was the version one, basically. And the, we took everything from that strategic board game. We took everything from other games, except for one thing. That's the mechan mechanism on that tracker to basically two markers moving that define four factions. That was the only innovation we had, basically. And we, basically the only thing we kept. Um, yeah, and then I think inspirations, we, I have like a ton of deduction games here. Um, so different deduction games were an inspiration. One of my favorites is I Spy. Not so many people know that game. I really love that game. Um, yeah, I don't think I've played it. I, like, is it, is, what kind of deduction game is it? It's a game like area control, probably area control, not really area control. It's like you, you move around the board and it's one of the games where you play two to four players an hour, one and a half hours, and a 
almost every time end of the game, I didn't have a clue what the other players were playing. Nice. It was so hard to figure out what they're doing because there's so many indirect ways to influence. Um, and I was like, at least 50% of players, I was surprised that, oh my God, you were playing France? How come? Because there's, <laughs> six, there's six nations and only up to four players are playing, but all nations make progress due to a very smart concept. Hmm. Um, and it's so smart. Unfortunately, the art and the, 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 the finish of the game could have been better. So right. all of my people have problems with it, for example. Mm. But the game mechanics are very smart. So this game, for example, inspired us uh, nice. a, a lot, um, even though it's not quite popular. Yeah, that's really good to hear. I love your problem of we designed a game and then we sat down and played it. It was way heavier than we were expecting. You've like described every every person who's went out to make a game and they sat down to play it the first time. They're like, why are these mechanics in here? There's just too many of them. Like it doesn't like we don't need all these mechanics. Like I I'm very familiar with that feeling of we need to simplify this. And that's like the hard part of making a game is not adding cool things. It's taking away not cool things, right? Like that's that's what's way harder when you're making a game. Um, yeah. Yeah. In product management, we say it's always simple to make something complex, but it's complex to make something simple or it's very <laughs> hard. So yeah. that's why I love we that. love games that are simple, but still deep. So you can play that 300 times. It's not too simple. So that's right. getting boring. Right. Yeah, we were just having a conversation the other day about um, a, a, somebody that we, we talked to who was making a game and, they, and they, they got it to their first play test and they, they were like, this this is so terrible, like it's unplayable. Can't even get through the, the first play test. And it's it's funny because that is that is the starting line. Like you get <laughs> you get to that point and it's like, okay, this this is not a game yet. Like yep. this is just the starting line that, that then you can go make a game from. Yeah, and it, it is disheartening because a lot of people stop at the starting line. They're like, well, that idea wasn't fun. And it's like, no, 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 like it might be fun. You just have to figure out what part was fun and take away all the other stuff. <laughs> so it's it's a always a similar challenge and something I'm sure some of our listeners are familiar with as well. Um, I wanted to talk about the fact that, uh, one, thank you so much for backing 73 other games before you launched your game. Like, I see so many people that launch a game and this is something I complain about all the time. And they have like one back or zero backed and they're like, Oh yeah, like come support me. Like I, I made this thing and I'm worthy of your support. It's like, no, like you need to give to this community before you take from this community. Right. And so like the first thing I saw was that you guys had 73 back games and I got excited because I was like, well, they obviously number one, they understand Kickstarter and how, how it works and what it is and what it isn't because you've been through 74 other campaigns, 73 other campaigns with people, but also you, you, uh, You've just invested in other people. So thank you for doing that. And two, I saw this is your second created. And I was like, oh, I wonder what else they created. And then I saw that it was the the initial launch of Hidden Leaders. Can you tell us what changed between Hidden Leaders first Kickstarter and the second Kickstarter? That's the most funny story of all. We even ha didn't have a first campaign. It was an absolute accident. <laughs> After accidentally clicked the button and a page was live. Medium oh. November. <laughs> and we were, oh my god, no, we just we thought we're taking the pre-page life. Yeah. <laughs> the page life. And we had to stop it immediately. And unfortunately, we couldn't delete the project. So we now yeah. have this empty project that were run that was running for an hour with zero yep. backers with no one. We, we thought it's the pre-page. <laughs> so <laughs> that's the story. To encourage you, you are not the only person that has done that. I literally covered another page earlier this week uh, on Ivy backed that had done the same exact thing. And I'm pretty sure I almost accidentally put Moonrakers live early too. Uh, I don't think it was um, live like before anything was on the page. It was like live like a day early. I almost, cause I was just like, how much steps do I have to do before this will actually go live? And like, I almost went too many steps far basically. So it was terrifying. So that's hilarious though. Thank you for, for sharing that. I, I, that's very funny. Um, I, I went through the same process of going to the page and seeing two back and I was like, Oh, this is their second game. Great. And I went and I looked at it and I was like, Oh, this got canceled. And then I was like, that's great because it means that like something wasn't really working for them and they, they took it and they took time to like figure it out and make it better. And now it's back and it's doing great. And it was almost something that like made me more interested in the project. <laughs> Uh, so hopefully that's how everyone is feeling. And, and this misclick that you had is just like, yeah. uh, 
giving more confidence to to backers in, in, on your game. Yeah, I actually think it might be a happy accident because I looked at it and I was like, oh, that means they they took like time to like hone it and refine it and they took feedback from other people and then this is like a, a new and better version of this game and it's hilarious because it was just an accident and that actually didn't happen but it it might feel like an accident that hurts you and i think it actually might be an accident that helped you i agree <laughs> which is hilarious um all right so my my other question is around strategic deduction i'm obviously a big fan of that uh i i cannot wait to play on wednesday the initial like problem we had was like how much do you invest in the like deduction side like how much is like the victory the victory figuring being who can you figure out who the other people are and then how much is it just based on how you play strategically um and it, and it's like you it's a hard balance because you want figuring out like if i know who sam is i want that to help me in the game but i also don't want it to completely ruin sam's game did you guys face challenges in your play testing and and like on how much to make it matter on figuring out who everyone else is yeah we had a lot of debate on that because like there are two or three types of games the three of us really like it's deduction but i have at least 10 deduction games and we like everything that has a lot of play and action we don't like that we have all three not fans of worker placement, the typical where everyone optimizes for three hours. And then we check, oh, who has more speaker voice coming and let you on. Yeah. I don't like this type of games. Like if you see worker placement, it's most of the time I, I think this is not my game, even though these great games. Um, mm -hmm. And I at least want to try every worker placement top game once uh, to just get the experience. But it's I'm not as engaged. I love interaction, right. negotiations, manipulation, bluffing, stuff like this. Um, and in the initial version, I would say we had a, a decent amount of deduction or a decent amount of passive deduction, but we realized in playtesting that it was, that it only was with more advanced players because it had, you had to have a bit of an advanced style to be able to, to, to know how to bluff and mislead other people. That was a problem we have, we have seen. So we then like based on, on, a, on a lot of feedback, we decided to, to change about 20 of 60, back then it was 60 cards, like a third of the cards to make them more yeah. ambiguous, to say, okay, you play a red card, but it with a good ability, but it benefits actually the blue faction, or right. it's, it might benefit the blue, black or red faction. So it's it's kind of easier to, to make subtle bluffers, bluffs for people who don't want to aggressively bluff. And one thing I want to add here is like people sometimes mix up social deduction and deduction. Mm -hmm. I, every time one talks about social deduction, I won't say that I wouldn't say our game is not so much social deduction, meaning yeah. I pretend to be someone else. I pretend to have another role, um, which is like the resistance, social deduction, werewolf, social deduction, it's really social. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we are more deduction, meaning like combining, understanding, reading behavior of like, oh, you push this up, oh, you take that card, oh, you put this card away. I think you're doing this. You can do a bit of social as well by kind of pushing on a plane and say, hey, like, I think you're that, but actually that's my role. So I just pretend. So you can do a bit of social deduction, but right. you don't have to. You can very passively bluff. Um, mm -hmm. And actually, a lot of women gave us very positive feedback on the game because he said, I don't like bluffing games. I'm so bad at like lying and bluffing, mm -hmm. but in this game, I can do it so passively um, with my moves and actions. I don't have to lie to someone in, in, in their face. Right. And that's something we realized in playtesting and we try to emphasize more saying, okay, we give you options to bluff, but you don't have to, you can go all in straight. And it would work with experienced players. It doesn't work with unexperienced players. You probably don't need to bluff a lot. But an experienced player against two people who play very openly was most likely to win. So we had a lot of debate on that and how, how much shall we make it hidden and how many hidden heroes can you play? And that's, it's very tough to balance. Yeah, it is. It is really hard. I, we dealt with that too with like with Veiled Fate when we were designing that and, and still even, even after the Kickstarter with like re previews and reviews and stuff, people, people that, aren't quite as good at bluffing or people aren't good as at deduction games would say that they didn't have enough control over their player or like they felt like if they did control their player, they were instantly giving away. And so that like that learning curve is a hard thing to, to counteract. And so I think some people have, have made the complaint about that game as being 
too random as in, not random, but like you don't have enough control over your character. Do you get similar complaints about uh, a complaint is the wrong word. How, how did you mitigate the feeling of not having control over your character? If there's so many cards that are able to push different people at the same time. So there is obviously a little bit of a fact, particularly with five and six players that your individual control is diminishing more and more. I think with two to four players, that's not such mm -hmm. a big problem. Um, with five players, you probably need a little bit, you need to compensate with more social deduction, actually. Ah. Kind of manipulating or kind of forging alliances and say, hey, like we, I think he's like pushing the undead. You don't want to do this as well. Come, come on, help me to push back. So you, I love that. I have accounts, you probably need to do a little bit more interaction on the table um, to influence what other people do. With lower player accounts, you don't need to do this too much. And I think one key element here is that triggering the game end in our game is very essential. Like because it's an it's whenever at any point a, a player has a certain number of cards in their tableau, the game mm -hmm. ends. So even if you have seven cards, for example, in your tableau, in my turn, the game ends. So like figuring out how to when and how to best trigger the end of the game. So that's in my favor is also can also be a very important strategic aspect. Hmm. And I, there are some cards that I can like build up on my hand to say, okay, I prepare a final move, but then it might not turn out for some reason. So there are interesting card combinations to say I'm full focused on making game end at the right point, or I'm full focused on, on having enough hidden cards. So I surprise them at the very end. So, and so there are very different ways to approach it. And we have six leaders. And you have th those are kind of unique win combinations, mm -hmm. and we com com like cal calculated there are fifty seven ways of how these leaders could combine from two to six mm -hmm. players. Um, awesome. So there are so many different ways the game or can feel that. Yeah, on the one hand side, it's hard to come up with this clear strategy, but I think here we're benefiting. We have some benefits from having a short game. Yeah, because you play twenty minutes, twenty five, and then you realize hmm, first it might feel a bit random, but then you realize I think at this point I made a mistake. I mm. should have not played that card. Um, I should probably have, or I should have uh, revealed myself and pushed more in a direction. So it's always this learning effect. After twenty minutes, where I thought hmm, I learned something for my next game, and then I will yeah. be better. And this I... is this is something which works quite well, I would say. I loved your two answers and. Like especially the like as in, as player count increases and how play and player agency does decrease because there's more turns in between your turn. Like the board state is changing more between your being able to affect it. And that's totally true. But I love your answer in that that's where the social deduction part element can can be beneficial, right? And it, it will increase. I actually never made that connection, but I think that's probably true for Veiled Fate as well. That's really interesting. I mean, I cannot wait to play this game. I. I'm so excited to to play it on Wednesday just because I I know I'm gonna love it and I love that you know the second part of your answer which is the, like it's a short game like take a step back analyze what you did you're like man I missed it by one point and it's like oh that other turn I could have I could have been a little bit more risky maybe revealed a little bit more more who I was but you could have pushed it just a little harder so I love that um, yeah really good answer um, for the uh, people watching if you have a question please ask that now. Um, we have questions from our Discord that we're going to do right now, um, but please ask a question on on the stream, and we will be able to to field that as well. Um, the first question is uh, from Kev, and this is from our Discord. He wants to know how does a shorter playtime change how you think about hiding your role? Um, and I'm going to add on to that question just slightly because I I want I want to know a little bit more. But like, does it make you play riskier knowing that it's a shorter playtime? I'm not sure it's you're more risky. You're obviously more open to experiment mm -hmm. and say, I'm, I'm, I'm experimenting this time. I'm trying to play more open this time. But it also depends a little bit on the hand you have. Like the starting hand, similar to poker, will probably define what kind of strategy might work out better. Um, so right. knowing that is important. And I think as an experienced player, it's very important to learn as quickly as possible what the, or get an idea what the other players try to do. And try to hide it longer, like make you should figure out first before they do figure out, so you can adjust your strategy. I would say 
short player time, it, it, it invites you to experiment. That's what I would say. You might take risky experimental moves or make a funny, fun turn that combines three cards at the same time, which you probably wouldn't risk in a long game. You say, okay, if it fails, then I have, a, like, I learned how that move benefits mm -hmm. myself. So sometimes people have moves where they were able to put three cards down in one turn and mm -hmm. then realized even, so they could end the game faster, but right. then they realized, like, now I have a tableau that is, advanced but actually not what i need <laughs> and so you feel like a fun move but actually it's not a meaningful one so no, that's awesome yeah no i that's a great answer i love the it makes you able to experiment more is is fun i like that uh sebastian on youtube asked about the the tug of war sometimes your markers can get into area like a one and two area and then some of the actions on the hero cards don't fully work, like negative one, negative two. Um, he said that they played it with a house rule where they could go beyond the edge of the board, but is that something you, you've talked about and considered? We actually never tried that, like going beyond the board or even come, like going kind of in a circle and then ending being, being on the other side again. But <laughs> would, it, would be neat, like if that's a round board and yeah. something go from negative to war, it would be a crazy experiment. Maybe it's something we should try. It's it also helps. Like we we wanted to keep the end of the board, so it somehow keeps the balance together. So if like everyone pushes, like two players aggressively push down, you somehow as a third player still can influence it a bit. Otherwise, we feel that the the the, the balancing would go out of control too much. That's our feel, but. Maybe it's worth some experimenting, and we are always happy if people share their house rules and the experiences they've made and like adjustments. And so we could bring up some variants, basically. Yeah, and you guys have a pretty active like uh, testing Discord as well, don't you? Yeah, we, we in the beginning we said we we are not sure we're able to handle that all uh -huh. the input, and we are not sure we are we be able to build it up. So a week into the Kickstarter, my brother said like I'll do this. I get the mm -hmm. Kickstarter, uh, this uh, Discord community set up, and now we are just like we are amazed of what, what people coming up with and how supportive they are. We have data yeah. scientists helping us to look at all the 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 player uh, player um, play test records. Every evening we have multiple records, people sharing their results. So we have almost seventy recorded games in our just from the. Nice. From the Discord community, so we're collecting a lot of additional input and data. We're discussing mm -hmm. cards. We're discussing add-on expansion ideas. We have a story channel where we develop the story. We have an art channel where we we even come up with small design challenges we have and say, "Hey, has mm -hmm. anyone an idea how we could make this even better?" Um, so it's it's like we are absolutely amazed on how many people are passionate to contribute. Yeah. Um, no, we'll I love to hear that. Practices. Yeah, I love to hear that. You guys should comment with your Discord um, uh, link. I'm actually on the Discord, so I'm excited to to get involved there. Um, but you should comment in after the show with the Discord link uh, to so people can join that. We're really, really uh, we have an amazing involved fan base in our Discord. I can honestly say Veiled Fate would never have been made, or at least would not be nearly as good without without that fan base. Because I mean, it was right when the pandemic hit, and we couldn't do any playtesting in person at all. And so they were our play testers and we played on TTS. And so it's hold on to that community. Don't, don't let it go after the play testing dies on, try, like try to make it last. Cause it, it's amazing to have those, those supporters activated and, and interested in, and continuing to, to be a part of your guys' journey of making games. So uh, I'm, I'm really, uh, really excited for you guys. Keep that going. Cause it's, it's been the single best thing for, for our games is having that community. So I'm happy to hear you guys are also getting it. Um, all right, so that was from Kev. Um, Hooper Nakao wants to know what's your favorite player count? I would say three and four. Three and four players. I think two and five is also good. Six is works. It's fun if you play with experienced players. I, I don't like to play six players online. It takes right. longer. It's Particularly, if you even if you then have players who are not familiar with online playing, if you have experienced players of hidden leaders, experienced tabletopia or tabletop simulator players, yeah. I think it's okay with six players online. Um, but my favorite is definitely three and four. Yeah, I'm even glad you had. Say, sorry, go ahead. 
I, I, I usually don't like two player games and I had the pleasure to test this a lot with my wife. And actually it's also quite a lot of fun with two players. Yeah. Uh, a lot of funny evenings. That's good to hear. I, I personally am glad you kept it two to six because there's some nights when I have three couples, like it's me and my wife and two other couples. And we're like, not that many games play at six. Right. And it's, I'm really glad you guys kept that, uh, on there. So, um, yeah, really pumped about that. Um, and then two players. I, it's surprising that strategic deduction games can work really well at two players. I agree with veiled fate. It was one of my favorite modes and everyone was like, no, it won't work at two players. And I was like, Oh, I, I guess I agree. And then I started playing it a lot at two players during testing. And I was like, I actually love this. This is great. So I'm, I'm really happy that you and your wife had a similar experience. That's awesome. Um, and, and Chris Ch Chesney says, I wish games would put plays one to six recommends three to four. Chris, what would our channel be for then? Now, you know, that hidden leaders is best at three to four. I mean, we'd be out of the job if, if th that was on the box. So yeah, I'm glad it's not on the box. No, <laughs> you just, it's, that's a marketing thing. If it was put on there, that's what BGG is for, right? Like it, they, people vote on what the best player counts are. So, um, Ilya wants to know, uh, I have a question. Do you already have plans for future games or expansions? So we have the, like, we haven't uh, advanced is probably too much, but somewhat advanced development to expansions, uh, right. we both like one will build on top of the deduction elements and make it even more tricky to figure out who, who are the other players, brings additional leaders into the game. It's, it, I think it's very nicely integrated in the game. It's more of what we have. In a, in a smart way. It's not making it crazy complex, but it definitely gives, gives more depth for people who want more of that game. Uh, and then we have another strategic, interesting expansion, but we decided to not include it in Kickstarter to not make the Kickstarter too complex and rather deliver that game on time, on quality, and have a separate Kickstarter, take the time with the community we've built now to develop these expansions further and we might come early next year with like maybe an expansion pack of three expansions, two from our ideas, one from the, the community ideas, and then like make kind of a modular expansion concept. But we definitely come with, with, with expansions. Whether we do a different game, we don't know yet. It's just like, first we need to kind of finish this experience here. Yeah. I mean, I think that was wise from like a, a first Kickstarter perspective. Like it's just, it's hard to, um, yeah, it's hard to know how hard it's going to be to make the, the final product and and not risking not being able to deliver on time or deliver at the quality you want by adding more content. I think that's wise. It's also, it's just a lot to play test. It's a lot to balance. It's much better to deliver an expansion next year when it's when it's the, the expansion you know you want. Like it's, it's the gameplay is honed perfectly rather than, you know, provide content that people are asking for now and then not like as much because it wasn't, it wasn't all the way done. So I, I think that was smart of you guys. Um, uh, Tech Ninja from our Discord wants to know about the art, especially on the stretch goals. So you guys have a, a lot of stretch goals. They wanted to know if you guys had been preparing for that ahead of time, or if you've had to like develop the art as new stretch goal and ideas have happened. So we planned the stretch goals or the stretch goal content. We tested it up front. We planned mm -hmm. it in from, from the 16 cards. We basically had 12 planned in, which we really wanted to achieve um, right. because we thought this, this gives just more to the game. And we had four stretch goal heroes. Um, mm -hmm. One of them was achieved yesterday, uh, like two of them basically were achieved yesterday. Those are the three awesome. queens of the emperor, plus a fourth one, which hopefully will be achieved tomorrow. It's also a very, very exciting character. Those four, we decided to do after the first day of Kickstarter. Because nice. we said we have to, we make this dependent on how how far we can go and get. Because mm -hmm. it's a lot of additional investment into artwork, money yeah. wise, and only if we see that we can reach certain limits, we gotta invest more more on that stage. So totally. basically, after, after day one, we sent an email to the artist and said, "Can you draw? Like, can you design design that? Here is the story." We tested those, we tested them, like the the mechanics mm -hmm. a lot, but we were not sure whether they will be in this Kickstarter. Uh, or whether they will come with the expansion. It's, so we have it's basically a mini expansion that we added, which is four cards, but still a very nice one. So this was the, the part we kept open, depending on the success of the campaign. And yeah. some of the 
the cardboard chips were also connected, for example, to the success of the campaign. So right. some were really depending on the success, but we made sure we test everything up front. So we have nothing untested, just out of emotion uh, coming on top. Yeah, I mean, you guys have hit a lot of different stretch goals. I mean, it's a lot of good things. So I'm pumped for you guys. I'm I'm hoping to see this top 300K. I think that would be incredible. You guys are at um, at 189 with six days to go. I mean, it can get there. I mean, you do you do a lot those last two days usually. So I'm I'm pumped for you guys. I'm I'm really hoping it, it caps 300. So um, yeah, that's gonna be awesome. Um, our next question is. Um, a a really good one as far as just like uh learning and and we learned so much from moonriggers but uh this is from i actually didn't write who this is from i'm gonna have to credit them afterward they want to know how the first kickstarter campaign went and how it helped uh informed your second uh yeah it will inform your second campaign if you guys do another one hmm, that's a very good question so i think <laughs> we haven't done the the reflection yet and this kind of wrapping up we are so much in the, in the mood of like operations okay what which which designs do i have to do today okay here's so much input from the community i need to kind of update the rules we want to have everything ready for production basically a week or for translation a week after the campaign so we can get started uh as as, as soon as possible so we're doing a lot of this side on this uh, this stuff on the side so we're very so like focused on executing on that campaign on, on all fronts that we haven't done a proper reflection yet we're mm -hmm. gonna do this uh, on a beer friday next week after yeah. the campaign is over. <laughs> um i'm going to vienna um meeting my brother and like and, and, and rafael uh to have like there's a corona time you cannot do a lot but at least having a beer yeah yeah <laughs> do it and then nap and, for like two two weeks because it's Running a Kickstarter campaign is exhausting. Yeah, so I don't know what we have learned yet. So we have learned obviously a lot on, on, on the marketing front, on the how do we engage and talk with the community. But what the actual learnings are, I think I need to go on a drawing board and like put that there. Just I can't. It's too much input. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It yeah. is really hard. I don't blame you there. That's uh, there's not a lot of capacity while you're in the middle of it. Um, I would I would be very curious to hear how your translation stuff goes um, after the campaign. I think that that's that's one of the areas that ended up being a much bigger struggle for us um, after. Yeah. Um, but you're doing it a little differently than we did it, so that um, that's an area I'm curious to see how it how it goes for you. Yeah, first, we don't have too many translations to make. Obviously, the, the rule book needs to be translated, and every card is about two lines of text. Right. That's it. Like, it's it's OK. Like, it's not a lot of content. Mm -hmm. Like, if I look at Tainted Grail, I oh my God, that <laughs> translation must have been crazy. Um, and we want to put, obviously, a lot of focus on keeping the, the, the names that make you smile in every language. So we have decide, defined my, uh, de designed a, a guideline, a five-page guideline of how to write names for our, like how mm. to translate the name. So that's not literally translated, but coming with the creative concepts. Mm -hmm. um, and we have basically a, like publishing partners who will who are professionals in in translating or localizing games. So they will do that. They will have a couple of weeks of time. We prepare all the files, send the files to them. They translate it. We will share some examples with the community for the community to give us feedback, kind of proofread it, and then send it over to, to, to the production side. And obviously, we manage we're producing everything in one single factory. Um, and we were able to get a good deal on multiple languages. Um, and with this, we can quality control that uh, on this front. But I, I do assume it will be a lot of work. And most of our partners have a lot of experience. One or two are pretty new to the publishing business. So we expect to be, we have to be a bit closer to them and we need to help them a bit more. So this is also where we probably will then collect more community feedback. For example, our German partners, they are very well known for high quality localization. I have no doubt that these guys are also French partner, for example, that they will deliver high quality translations here. 
Um, so we know which partners we need to support a bit more, which partners we can actually learn from. And we have experienced partners. Matago has done 25 Kickstarter campaigns themselves. Their, their owner, Ano, is like an amazing supporter. He's so helpful. Um, and he basically guides us and helps us and says, like, guys, don't do this, do this. Be mindful on that. I've done this 10, 20 times. So he's a mentor, you could say, who helps us uh, on, on multiple fronts. Yeah, that's awesome to hear. That's awesome to hear. I, I'm. I was when I initially looked at the campaign page for IP IV backed. I was very worried about the number of languages. I was like, this is too many languages. And then I got to your partners page, and I was like, oh, okay, I can see this being more realistic because they've they've ahead of time figured out how to do this. It's not just like we'll figure it out after the campaign's over. Like it'll be fine. We'll we'll figure it out how to translate it into twelve different languages or whatever it is. And it's I'm glad you guys you took the time to to figure all that out. And obviously that's where your business acumen is coming in. See, if you weren't a part of this project, it would they'd been like, oh yeah, we can do twelve different languages and figure it out later. And it would have been terrible. But I mean I don't know which of you came up with those things, but obviously it's it so takes a team. It takes a it takes a village to make a game. So initially we said we only will do English. Um, because the one of our core values is simplicity, not just in the game, but simplicity also in the process, not mm -hmm. like overloading it with, with stuff. So we wanted to do only English and said we can do additional languages if we find a professional partner helping us with that. We can't do this. We can't take the risk. We can't to take the, 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 take the effort. So, and then somehow this chain got started, like more and more partner reaching out. We have, a, I guess, a one supporter who is super well connected in the industry who helps us a lot with, and he understands how to negotiate the deals in, in, in a good way. So basically one of the things we're doing is like trusting professionals, mm -hmm. knowing where we don't, what we don't know and where we need help, and then knowing where we take the decisions. And I think that's something we all learned in our professional career and we bring into that world. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, Nicholas uh, on the page has said, he's really excited to learn more about the new heroes, but I know that's coming out tomorrow, so I'll be patient. So I guess he's eagerly awaiting a Kickstarter update from you guys. We have Sebastian saying that they really, really love Satoshi Matsura. I think I said that right, correct me if I didn't. Um, and really excited to see what his next project is in addition to this. Hopefully, he's hoping for more art, uh, so obviously loves your guys' art a lot. Um, and then Nicholas also wants to know, speaking of names, how did you guys come up with all of them? Did you have a system or just threw ideas around and see what sounded fun? It sounded like your brother was leading the charge on that, but do you have any more, uh, just insight into his process? They, they, there is no process actually. It's like, <laughs> we, we, sometimes we look at the character and obviously my brother is just coming up with names all the time. All the mm -hmm. time. Then we do some discussion. Oh, that's fun. That's more fun. And sometimes we ask the community, and he's like pushing out something on Twitter, like, do you like this game name more or this name more? And, and uh, asking people. And I would say it's a combination. Sometimes it's just something counterintuitive, like vegetarian shark guard. It's like, yeah. just what the heck? <laughs> uh, <laughs> sometimes it's just um, we want to transport some like deeper meaning with it. Um, or have a sort of multi-sided aspect to the name. Uh, sometimes it's it's just a word combination like ghastly granny, like ghost and gas, like <laughs> yeah, like you, you get it. Like it's a yeah, I get it. Uh, right. A new name uh, or like a combination of name. So yeah. I, I think it's just the 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 the. the professional side of my brother, like being a, someone who is very good with words and coming up with stuff and ideas. It's no special process. It's just random, like random. Yeah, yeah. just <laughs> say it. Um, so Sebastian said that he has to give kudos to the continuity the campaign has. You guys avoided the mid campaign slump, which is a very, very real thing. Um, he said that that's very rare for, for first time creators. And so a bunch of other people were for jumping in for that, for sure. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm pumped for you guys. I'm, I've been really impressed by the page, really impressed by the game. Can't wait to play it on Wednesday. Um, thank you so much for, for coming on the show and telling us a little bit more about the process that you guys had and the journey that you had. It, it makes the games feel so much more real when you get the, to, to talk to the people behind them and, and hear the journey that they took to get there. So 
What were you going to say, Sam? So your your um, partners are jumping in here in the chat and uh, <laughs> having a little bit of a... a oh. <laughs> we have a four-page guideline, says the brother. <laughs> but it's also a lot of intuition, too, and it's not random. <laughs> You guys can fight about this later. Yeah, yeah. You might you might be buying beer on Friday. I'm not sure. But uh <laughs> Yeah, but these kind of questions I need him online. Like <laughs> yeah. he's the guy explaining the creative stuff in structure <laughs> I'm the same way. I'll get asked an art question in that Zach's thing, and I'm just like, uh, it was pretty. And they're like, you don't have anything more than that. I'm like, well, let's call Zach because uh, I'm not I'm not the person to answer this question. So I'm right there with you. No worries. Um, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's been a blast having you. Blast talking to you. I'm looking forward to playing. I don't know if you're playing on Wednesday uh, next week, but I'd I'd love to to play with you or, or anyone else from BFF. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for for coming on and chatting with us. Yeah, I will be there on Wednesday. Thank you very much for the very interesting questions. Some questions that well, really uh, going a bit into interesting parts of the whole thing. So thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming on. Uh, everyone, thank you so much for watching. Uh, we are doing a giveaway for Moodle, Moodle Metal Moonrakers ship tokens. <laughs> They're not being made out of noodles. Uh, and all you have to do is comment in the comment section after the video is done with the word hidden in some way. Um, the link to the Hidden Leaders Kickstarter page is in our description of this video. Please go check out their page. It is definitely a game that we have backed and something that we are very excited to get and very excited to play next week. Um, so thank you guys for watching and thank you so much for, for joining us. And yeah, we'll see you next week on Ivy Games Weekly.